That is nice. <laughs> it's the little things. Lower that. Good evening. It's good to see everybody. Sorry. I haven't had coffee this afternoon, and I might have needed some, but it's good to see everybody this evening. Um, I want to start out by asking you a question. This is not a trick question. You don't have to answer with my name. I know you're going to want to, but you don't have to. You'll find out here in a second. <laughs> Who's your favorite pastor? Yeah, see, trick question. <laughs> No, but do any of you actually have like a pastor that other than me, because you do come here on Sundays and uh, listen to me speak, but uh, do any of you have a, a pastor that you listen to a lot of times outside of church? Anybody that you want to share, maybe? Any great names out there? David Dr. David Jeremiah. Yep, he's a good one. I love to listen to sermons. I listen to podcasts all the time. Um, a lot of times I'll listen to that more than I'll listen to the music because uh, I just get tired of music sometimes. I listen to a song over and over and over and it's just like I'm tired of that song now. So uh, I listen to a lot of sermons and I, I really enjoy a lot of different kinds of pastors and everything. And um, there's a lot that I have found lately through the times that they really to me, really preach the word. And they do it in a way that it engages me, and they do it in a way that it relates to me, and uh, I just really feel that they are speaking truth. And we've had amazing pastors in the past, you know. Um, Jonathan Edwards wrote Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, Billy Graham is an ama amazing evangelist. Uh, D.L. Moody, is another great one. Uh, there are pastors who have taken churches from uh, congregations of a hundred, and in a matter of years, they have just seen those congregations explode. And two such pastors came to light about 10 years ago, and they, they both were about the same age. They were young pastors, and they both came to take over a church of about a hundred people. And then in about 10 years, both of their churches had grown to be about 3,000 or so in attendance. And I think actually today they're actually bigger than that. But one of these churches is the church of a man named Stephen Furtick. And he's pastor at a church called Elevation Church. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. It's in like South Carolina, I want to say, or something like that. Um, but they actually, I've been told, require tickets to be able to come into the building. It is just so big that they can't see everybody, so they require people to come into a church. Um, this church is also home to Elevation Worship, which they wrote songs like, Oh, Come to the Altar, which Heather and Abby sang a couple weeks ago, and we sang during revival. And so their worship team is really good, and they're some of those songs that I listen to a lot of times. Uh, Matt Chandler is the pastor of the other church, and he's pastor at Village Church down in Dallas, Texas. And both of these churches, again, started small, and they grew to a really big number. But there's a difference in how they grew. I saw a video about this, and now this video was kind of leaning more towards Matt Chandler in the video. So take that with what it's worth. But the difference in which they grew is this. Elevation Church grew in attendance by being told how amazing the people were. It was very people-focused. And so they, they really said, you can accomplish great things. You are powerful. You are amazing. And then Village Church grew by not telling people how amazing they were, but actually kind of the opposite, and really focusing on who God is and who Jesus is. It was more of a gospel-centered church, and it grew around the gospel. And so the reason I tell you about those two is because both of them grew and did amazing things, but both were kind of speaking different things. One was speaking more gospel-centered about who Jesus is, and one was speaking more just motivation. You guys can do it. You're great people. And so this kind of lines up with what John is talking to us about in our passage tonight. We're still going on in 1 John. And the question is, are they preaching the gospel of Jesus? Just because it's a giant church and they're popular pastors doesn't mean they are preaching a true gospel. And this is something like, again, I love to listen to pastors, and but it's something that I notice as I hear about a new pastor or I pick up on a new pastor, I really try and guard what I believe. 
I mean, you know, are they speaking the truth of God? Are they going to scripture? Because there's this one church in Los Angeles called Mosaic, and it's a huge church. It's in the Mecca of Los Angeles, and I, it's doing good things. They have a big attendance. But I noticed that as I started listening to them, the pastor was really good at motivating me. Like, yeah, I'm a good person. Yeah, I'm, I'm great. But as I started listening to it, it was like he never once quotes scripture. He never once talks about Jesus. It's God and it's all this stuff. But it was like, you know, you are more of a motivational speaker than you are really teaching me about Jesus. And so it, it was just interesting. But I say all of that because, again, I believe John in 1 John chapter 4 is telling us, watch out. He is telling us. I, I don't believe it. It's truth. He is telling us. And so we're in 1 John chapter 4, and we're about finished with our study on uh, 1 John. And so if you'll stand, we're going to read the first, z first six verses of 1 John. So 1 John verse 4, 1 through 6. And it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and now is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's open in prayer. God, we just thank you so much that we can just come and open your word, and God, that your word will speak to us, that we can read your word in private, and that you are active, and you are living, and you are wanting to be involved in our life, and so that you will speak to us through it. And so, God, I just pray that tonight, as we come together, that we just hear your word spoken, that it be your truths that are spoken through me. So remove me from the situation, allow it to be your word spoken, and may it fall on hearts that are just ready to be transformed into who you are calling us to be. And it's in your name we pray, amen. And so it seems like right away, John is telling us to be careful when you're listening to someone. You see, for, for the longest time, there was only one person in a church who would be able to read a Bible. And there was only one person in a church who actually knew what the Bible said. It was even, I believe, written in a different language or in a language that only a priest could read. And so nobody else was able to know what it was said. And so when you think about that, think of like how dangerous that is. If none of you would bring a Bible, and if I never threw it up on the screen, and I just came up here and just started saying, God says, give me everything. Well, I don't have a Bible. Maybe God really says that. I believe all of you would be like, no, that's not happening, Andy. But you know, I mean, it, it's like there's danger in that. And so we need to be alert. We need to know what we are reading. And we, I mean, I've been like listing blessings that I see in my life on social media. And one of them is the Bible, that we have it in our own language, that I can open this up. And I have like 15 Bibles, I think, different. Some are the same version. Some are big, some are small. Some people have a giant Bible that weighs like 20 pounds on their coffee table that is like a decorative piece. Uh, everybody, if you have a smartphone, has the capability of having a Bible wherever you are at. And so it's like we all can be in the Bible. It can be with us anywhere. It's not a hidden gem, but rather it is now an accessible one. And John is saying, this is what we need to go to to test everything that we hear. And I'm going to be honest, this kind of freaks me out as a pastor. Because John's saying, hey, you guys, make sure what Andy is saying up there is the truth. Don't just take him for his word. Don't just believe everything he says because he's Andy or because he's got the position. Test what he's saying. Take it for what the Bible is saying. Be in your word. So when I open up the word and when I'm reading, have your Bibles open as well. Make sure that I'm not reading some nonsense and then applying it in some crazy way, which that scares me, honestly, because imagine going to work every single day and then being like, today you have an, a performance evaluation. And then next week you're going to have another performance evaluation. And it's like, oh my goodness. 
But at the same time, I really enjoy it because it keeps me accountable, I hope. It keeps me desiring to know the truth and continuing to dive into what God says because I don't want to be a blasphemer. I don't want to speak untruth. I want to speak the word of God. I want to say what God says. But it's not just me. Just because somebody has a PhD next to their name does not mean that we can believe what they say. Just because they have five PhDs behind their name or, you know, they have a church of 20,000 people or whatever does not mean that they are necessarily speaking the truth. So we need to be on our guard and make sure that what we are hearing lines up with Scripture. Because Scripture will never contradict Scripture. And so if I'm up here saying something about Scripture that contradicts some other form of Scripture, I'm wrong. The Bible is never wrong. So John, he then explains to us how we can know what this truth is. He says, test the spirits, and this is how you can know if the Spirit is speaking truth. And he's telling us also the thing that they were experiencing at their time, because there were people going around who were claiming that Jesus was truly God, but they were questioning, was he really a man? Was Jesus really this man? Because at the very beginning, remember, John opens it entirely up by saying, Jesus was a man. He was fully God. He was fully man. I felt him. I, like, he relates to all the senses. He is hitting on the humanity of Jesus, which people are wondering about at this time. Is Jesus really a man? We believe Jesus was God. He rose from the dead, dead. But was he really this man? And we can get caught up in this today. I noticed this just kind of, you know, we're in the Christmas season. Look around, drive by houses that have mangers, and they're like beautiful, and they're pristine, and it's wonderful. And it's like Jesus was born in this perfect, like beautiful setup manger. And in reality, it was probably chaotic. It was probably uh, a lot of screaming. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, they all, cows, donkeys. It was probably not the beautiful scene that we see. And then also just kind of think about how you always view Jesus. Does Jesus ever get sick? Does Jesus ever experience pain? Do we add humanity to Jesus? Because so often I can view totally that Jesus was totally God and I take away from the manhood of Jesus, that he was also fully man. And so whenever I read passages that say Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin, I think, yeah, he pulled a God card on that. He wasn't really tempted in every way I was tempted because he was fully God. But we also need to realize he was still fully man. And so Jesus was holy man, fully man. And the only thing he did different than us is he had total dependence on God, whereas I don't totally depend on God. I fall short when I rely on myself, when I depend on my own doing. We have that same ability in our hands, in our grasp, but do we use it? Then there are also people in society today who say, well, yeah, Jesus, we, we have kind of flipped the switch on um, what they used to think back then. They thought that Jesus was God, but not man. And now there is physical proof of Jesus. A lot of people are like, yeah, there actually was a man named Jesus who walked on this earth around that time. But they're wanting to say he's not God. He isn't truly God. And these are false spirits. And so my bet is that everyone in here tonight would agree that Jesus was fully God, that he is the son of God. And if you don't, you're seeking at least, and this is a good place to be doing that. But C.S. Lewis, he wrote a piece in which he was arguing, it's called the Trilemma of Christ, and he's combating this view that Jesus was just a man. And he says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him being Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. 
Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. And again, we have evidence that Jesus actually walked on this earth. Uh, we just finished up the FBI class. And during that class, the very last class of, that, of this semester was talking about the Shroud of Turin. And it was really interesting, which if you don't know what the Shroud of Turin is, it is what they believe to be the burial cloth of Jesus. And I mean, he just kind of started breaking down all the information that is contained in this shroud. And it shows us how Jesus was crucified. It shows us the, the blood marks. It shows us like there was a, a beam of light that just etched all of the blood into the cloth without messing it up. And like, it was really interesting. But we have proof of Jesus' body being on this earth. But we still can't find the body because it's not to be found. Because he was fully man, but he is also fully God. And whenever you can understand that, please let me know and explain it to me. Because it's still just like, I, it, we take it by faith. We trust the word of God when it says that. And so how? Paul, is, or not Paul, John is telling us, don't be deceived. Don't follow these false teachers. So how do we keep from being tricked? What is the secret here? And I believe John tells us in verse 4 through 6, he says, You are from God, little children, and you have overcome them, being the false teachers. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So how do we know whether someone is speaking truth or whether they are not speaking the truth? The answer is by walking with Jesus, by you having personal, intimate relationships with Jesus, by staying close to him in his word through everything, clinging to him through everything. And so yesterday, my brother and I, we went to Kansas City to see a buddy of mine. And as we were driving up there, he, he came and picked me up. We were driving together, and my mom called me. And so we had both of my, my brother and I in the same car, and sometimes I think we sound alike. And so I set the phone on speakerphone so that we both could talk. And while we were driving, I thought, I'm going to confuse my mom, and I'm going to say some stuff and try and sound like my brother. And I'm going to get her to think that it's my brother talking. And so I tried, and she called me on it right away. She was like, Andy, I know that's you. And it was like, how do you know it's me? And she said, because I know your voice. I know you and I know Christopher. And it's the same way in our walk with Jesus. When we spend time with Jesus, when we invest in Jesus, when we grow and learn more about him, we begin to know who the true Jesus is. It's, said been, it's been said before that the greatest way to destroy an economy is to just flood the market with counterfeit bills. And the same could be said about religion. The same could be said about Christianity. The best way to destroy Christianity is to flood it with false Jesuses. And there are a lot of false Jesuses out there, a lot of false gods. But if you talk to an FBI uh, agent or anybody who deals with like money and they are supposed to be able to detect what a counterfeit bill is, they don't tell you that the way they are able to know if it's a counterfeit or not by studying every other counterfeit out there. They don't waste their time on all the other counterfeits. What they do is they study the real deal. They study a real bill and they know everything about it. They know the touch, they know the symbols, they know everything about it. And so again, we don't spend time with all these fake Jesuses. We spend time with the real Jesus. So when a fake one comes our way, we're able to be like, that's not truth. I know what the Word of God says. I know who Jesus is. I have spent time with him. He talks to me. I listen to him, and therefore I will not be deceived. Max Lucado, he wrote a book back in, I think it was around the early 2000s, and it's called The Song of the King. And in it, this prince, he comes up to the three like bravest knights in the country. And they're Carlisle, who is the strongest, it's Alon, who is the quickest, and it's Cassidon, who is the wisest. And he presents this challenge to them. And the reward for the challenge is they all want to marry the princess. And so he says, if you can complete this challenge, you get to marry the princess. But the challenge is this. 
you have to journey through hemlock, which it's like this really dark forest where a lot of people go in and they never come out. You get lost in there. And also on top of that, there's these creatures in there which are called hope knots. And they're like sly little creatures. They're not really strong, but they just capture you. They have yellow eyes. They're super clever and they just trick you through it all. And so the knights, they had some guidelines as they were going to be able to journey through hemlock. And so the three guidelines, or uh, one of the guidelines, is they don't have to travel alone. They can choose a companion to go through this forest with them. Another guideline is, or Alon, he actually asked, well, how are we going to be able to know where we're going when we're in the forest? And so the prince said, well, you see, three times a day, my dad is going to play a flute. And this flute is going to play a special sound. There's only two flutes like this, and they both play the same song. No other flute plays this. So in the morning, he'll play the song. At noon, he'll play the song. And in the evening, he'll play the song. And so then uh, Cassidon, the wisest, he was like, well, who is the other person? You, your dad has a flute. Who has the other flute? And so the prince said, I have the other flute. They play the exact same song. They sound exactly the same. They're pretty much one. And so a couple days go by, more days go by. Every day the king, he's, he's coming out in the morning, he plays a song. At noon, he plays a song. In the evening, he plays his song. People are waiting in anticipation. Finally, a scout spots out in the distance, two figures coming out. And they have no horse, they have no armor. And so the king's wanting to build up the suspense. So he says, go retrieve them. Don't tell anybody who it is. Just bring them in. We're going to throw a great banquet tonight, and we will find out who it is. And so as the banquet is getting ready, everybody's in anticipation. Is it Carlisle the strongest? Is it Alon the brave or the, the quickest? And so finally the king says for the, the victor to come through, and everybody is shocked because it is Cassidon. It is the cleverest one. And so the king says, tell us about your journey. And I'm going to read the rest of it. And so everyone's listening as Cassidon spoke. He said, the hope knots were crafty. They attacked, but we fought back. They took our horse, horses, but we continued. What nearly destroyed us, though, was something far worse. They intimidated. Each time the song of the king played on the flute and it would enter the forest, a hundred flutes would begin to play. All around us we heard music, songs from every direction. I don't know what became of Carlisle and Alon, but I know that strength and speed will not help one hear the right flute. The king asked the question that was on everyone's lips. Then how did you hear my song? I chose the right companion, Cassidon answered as he motioned for his fellow traveler to enter. The people gasped. It was the prince. In his hand, he carried the flute. Cassidon explained, I knew there was only one who could play your song exactly like you. There is no one else I would have trusted to be with me all the way. So I asked him to travel with me. As we journeyed, he played your song. I learned it so well that though a thousand flutes tried to hide your music, I could hear your song above them all. It was with me all the way. And so you don't have to look, for, look far at what the hidden message is of Lucato's story. That there's going to be all these distractions and these false gods and these fake Jesuses that are going to be thrown at you. But if we walk with the true Jesus, we will be able to hear it over all the distraction. And then John, he gives us this beautiful promise that we can hold on to. He says, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And this word greater here means greater. It means he is far superior. He is stronger. It means he is smarter. It means there is not one area that he is lesser. And so he'll guide us. He'll show us the truth. He'll lead us in the direction that we need to go, and he gives us the discernment along the way. But we have to be seeking after him. We have to, in the words of John that he's been speaking earlier, abide in him, and he will abide in us. And that is how we know what the truth is. And it seems like John wraps up this section by going all the way back to the beginning by, of this passage, by telling us about these false spirits. Because like I stated previously, just because the church is huge does not mean the word of God is being spoken. Because it says they will hear, the world will listen to them because they are of the world. And so people will come to hear what people of the world want to say. We're told in 2 Timothy 4.3, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as long as we are walking with Jesus, we need not worry about that. As long as we are truly seeking after the Jesus of the Bible, and I say it all the time, allowing God's word to mold our thinking, not molding Jesus to be who I want Jesus to be, not taking the the sayings that Jesus says that it's like, I really don't like that part, so I'm not going to apply it. That's not going to speak to me. But instead saying, God, I submit my life to your word. Show me your truth. And then choosing godly counsel through it all. And Jesus, he says, come after me. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. We need to seek after Jesus before anything else. It has to be about Jesus. And then he will guide us from there. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the promises that you give us. And God, I pray for discernment. That when we hear words being spoken, that God, we know truth from lies because there are a ton of lies out there. But God, you are the truth. And so I just pray that you give your truth to us and that we just walk in your truth, that we grow in your truth, and that we share your truth with those who need to be told it, who need to live by it, who need to hear it. And so, God, I just pray that you continue to work through us, that we just become your church in every area, that we totally submit in every area, but, God, that we not make it about this or that or anything else other than Jesus and Jesus alone, and that we walk in you in every way that we go. We love you, and it's in your name we pray.